In this video, we're going to talk about how to do nomenclature. So what I want to start off with is a review of how to do ionic compounds, going from the chemical name to the chemical formula. So, first up we have magnesium nitride. So magnesium has a symbol Mg, and if we look at our periodic table, we can see that magnesium is here in group two, which means that as a cation, it's going to have a plus two charge. So magnesium plus two, and nitride indicates, the IDE indicates that it is a monatomic anion, and nitrogen here needs one, two, three extra electrons to get to the noble gas configuration. So it will have a negative three charge. So if I start off with my positive two and one of them, one of the magnesium ions, and I add that to the negative three, and one of them, I'll end up with a negative one charge. So in order to get these charges to equal zero, I'm gonna need to have plus two times three plus negative three times two. So this will give me negative six this will give me positive six, which gives me zero, which is what I want to make a neutral ionic compound. So this number is going to end up being the subscript for magnesium. This number will end up being the subscript for nitrogen. So I have magnesium three, nitride two, right? So this is my chemical formula for magnesium nitride. Next up, we have potassium phosphate. Now potassium is in group one, which means it will have a plus one charge. So the potassium cation has a plus one charge. Phosphate is from our list of polyatomic ions, and it has a chemical formula of PO4, three minus, okay? Now again, this is something that you'll need to look up until you've memorized these, but eventually you will need to know that phosphate is always PO4, three minus. So we do our charge math again, we know that potassium has a plus one and our phosphate has a negative three. So if we started off with one and one of these guys, we added them together, we would end up with a negative two charge left over. So we're going to need to add more potassium ions. So if I have a plus one, and I have three of them, and I add that to my one phosphate ion, I'll end up with a net charge of zero, right? So again, this will be the subscript for my potassium, and this will be my subscript for phosphate. So I'll write K3PO4. And remember when there's a one, we don't write the subscript, right? Now, some students like to put parentheses around this guy to indicate that it's a polyatomic ion and that it's not going to separate, right? We have this whole guy is one guy. And this is the chemical formula for potassium phosphate. So now I wanna do another example, but now um, with a transition metal. And recall, transition metals have the Roman numeral written next to them of the charge or the oxidation state for the um, ion. 
So just like we did for the previous problems, we'll go ahead and start by writing the ionic notation. So I have lead has a symbol of PB. We know its charge is plus two. Um, it's positive because metals always make cations, right? They are metals because they like to lose electrons, and when lead loses two electrons, it becomes plus two. Nitrate is another one of our polyatomic ions, and it has a chemical formula of NO3 negative. So if I start off with one of my lead and one of my nitrate, I will end up with an overall positive one charge. So I'm thinking I'm gonna need to add nitrates. So I'll leave one lead ion and I'll try two nitrate ions. When I add these two together, I get a charge of zero for a neutral compound. Again, this will be the subscript for the nitrate ion. So we have PB, which just has a one, so we're not gonna write that. And nitrate, we have to write the parentheses around here, and then the subscript will be two. Now, in this first case, we said the parentheses are optional, right? Because we know that there's only one of these guys. In this case, the parentheses are not optional because now if we don't write the parentheses, it looks like we have 32 oxygens and that's not what we're saying here. We have two nitrate ions. So next step, we'll look at how to do covalent nomenclature going from the chemical name to the chemical formula. So with covalent nomenclature, we have prefixes. Now it's really important to remember that we never use these prefixes with ionic, compound, ionic compounds. So if we have covalent compounds, they will have prefixes, but ionic compounds will never have prefixes. Right? And how do we tell if they're ionic? Because they have metals in them, right? So covalent compounds are strictly made of non-metals. So here I have some names of covalent compounds and I'm gonna convert them to the chemical formulas. So first off I have the prefix di indicates that there are two nitrogens. So I'll write N two. The subscript is what's associated with this prefix here. And then the chemical symbol for nitrogen. And I have the next one has the prefix of pent or penta, which indicates that there are five. And we use the anionic form of the um, second nonmetal. Uh, why, I don't know. We just do. Um, this guy is the regular nonmetal name. This guy is always the anionic form. So we'll have oxygen and we have five of them. So our chemical formula here is N2O5, dinitrogen pentoxide. Next up we have phosphorus trichloride. Now notice there's no prefix out here. So if there's no prefix out front, then we know that there's only one of these guys. Now, if it helps you to just put mono out front, right, you're welcome to do that. If, however, you only have one of the second guy, then you have to write the mono, okay? And I'll show you an example of that. So if we have phosphorus, there's an implied mono 
out front that we haven't written. We know there's going to be one phosphorus. Tri means three, so we have three chlorides. Right? So PCl3 will be our chemical formula for phosphorus trichloride. Next step, we have sulfur hexafluoride. So again, there's an implied mono out front here. So we just have one sulfur and fluoride has six for hexa. So SF6 would be our chemical formula. Let's look at one more example. If we have carbon monoxide, right? Here we can see the carbon only has one and it doesn't have the mono out front. But oxygen has to have the mono out front because it's the second guy. So we get a chemical formula of CO, one carbon and one oxygen. Next up, we'll talk about nomenclature for covalent compounds going from the chemical formula to the chemical name. So here we have one phosphorus. So remember when we're writing the first one, if there's only one, we don't have to write the mono. So I'll write phosphorus. And then we see there's a five here. So we're going to look over here and see that five is penta. So we'll write penta chloride. Right. So this would be the chemical name for PCL5, phosphorus pentachloride. Next we have C2H8. So we come over here and we see that two is di. So this is going to be di carbon. And we have an eight for hydrogen, which means we're going to have octa out front. We have octa and hydride. Now, the uh, hydride, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about the misspelling there, guys. So uh, again, we use the regular non-metal name here and then the anionic form over here. So I'll just rewrite this for you guys without the spelling error. Octahydride, there we go. All right, and then last but not least, we have three nitrogens and seven oxygens. So three, we come over here, we see three is called tri. So this will be tri nitrogen. And seven is hepta. So this will be hept uh, oxide. Now when you have a vowel that starts off your, um, your second non-metal name, you have the option to drop this A, right? So if you had written trinitrogen hept oxide, that would also be correct, right? These two are both fine. So either one of these would be considered correct. Last, we want to look at going from chemical formula to chemical name for ionic compounds. So, starting off here, we have iron and oxide are going to be our ion names. Now recall that iron, Fe, is a transition metal, right? Which means that we'll have to write the charge of iron next to its name. So I know 
I have iron, and I know I have oxide. Now the question is, how do I figure out what the charge on iron is? So if I know that oxide has a negative two charge, right? And I know that there's three of them, that means that there's an overall negative six coming from all of the oxygen, all of the oxides put together, which means that all of the irons put together must have a positive six. So if they must have a positive six charge and there's two of them, then that means that each iron must have a positive three charge. So our chemical name will be iron three oxide. Now aluminum in our next compound is uh, technically still on the um, uh, post-transition post metal, um, metals group, right? So it's still a metal and it still um, could be named like a transition metal. But because aluminum always has a plus three, we don't need to write the charge. Remember there's three main guys that always have the same charge. Silver is always plus one, zinc is always plus two, and aluminum is always plus three. One, two, three, up the stairs. So, all right, aluminum. And again, I don't have to write the charge because I know that it's plus three. And so, let me try that again. Sulfate is SO4 two minus. Now, how did I know that that was sulfate? Because I have it memorized that this is sulfate. Again, that's another of the polyatomic ions that you're going to need to memorize. Next up, I have Na, which is sodium. Sodium is a group one metal, so I don't need to write the charge. And this guy here is called carbonate. Right, so my name is sodium carbonate here. Uh, last up we have lithium. Lithium is another group one metal. So we don't need to write a charge next to it. And this guy, OH, is hydroxide. Again, this is a polyatomic ion that you'll need to memorize. So lithium hydroxide will be the name. Um, and I have one more that's a little bit more complicated. This one has two polyatomic ions put together. So this first guy is called ammonium. And this guy is called phosphate. So it looks tricky here, but it's really a simple name. It's just ammonium phosphate. And that's all we've got.